Well, this is the graveyard shift, isn't it? You know, everybody's uh, been in for quite a few hours today. How are you all feeling? Full of energy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good stuff. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Um, I do appreciate it's towards the end of the day, and thank, thank you, you know, for spending the next 30 minutes, 40 minutes in my company. Uh, a lot of people have to be paid to do that, so I do appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is Mike, Mike Dickin. Um, so I'm the MD founder, Dog's Body, of Akapi SC. We are a startup consultancy business, supply chain consultancy business, and it will be our birthday in a couple of weeks' time, our first birthday. So that's something to look forward to. What is an Akapi? That is an Akapi, um, in case you were wondering. It's a difficult animal to choose for your business because its most striking feature is its backside and it doesn't look great on your company logo. Um, so we live and learn. We live and learn. A little bit about myself. <coughs> so I don't know why I'm looking now. I should know about me, right? Uh, so seven years with uh, Procter & Gamble, about seven years with Avon Cosmetics and similar time across Dairy Crest, who were then acquired by Muller. So before setting out by myself, I was the, uh, on the board of directors for Muller as the planning director. I've worked across the supply chain, manufacturing, through to procurement, new product development, um, major capex projects, lots of IBP implementations, demand planning, supply planning. I've always seemed to gravitate back towards planning in one shape or form. So what we're going to go through, so Carpi, we uh, first client was a business uh, we went into them just before the imminent Brexit, the first one, not the fourth one. Uh, so uh, we did some work with them. And we're currently business partnering, or we are uh, Lego's partner for a uh, global demand planning transformation project, and we are their implementation partners for, uh, for Europe. So we're pretty proud and excited to be, to be part of that. Um, so... I guess what might be a little bit different to presentations earlier today is most 95% of what I'm going to cover has been with existing tools, okay? It's been the same legacy systems that you are frustrated with and infuriated with. We've worked with lots of different demand planning tools. We've implemented some, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages, okay? So everything we go through today, apart from this little bit on machine learning, because you have to talk about that at the moment, it's going to be very much, we've done this without having to invest large sums of money. Okay? Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is really the right measures. So what measures do you have for demand planning? Well, how do you measure accuracy? MAPE. MAPE. Any others? WAPE. WAPE, yeah. MAD. MAD, okay. Yeah, so do you look at percentage accuracy or percentage error? Both. Both? Okay. All right, so I guess businesses that are glass half full may talk about their percentage forecast accuracy. Businesses, most businesses that are glass half empty will talk about your mean average percentage error. Yeah? We do not use MAPE. We do not use WAPE. We believe they're fundamentally valueless. Okay, so that can be the... Um, statement out there to grab some attention maybe and be a bit controversial. We don't use them. What do we use? We use spread of error and we use bias. Okay? And uh, we probably see bias at least as important, as important as forecast error. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So spread of error or why don't we like MAPE or WAPE or APE? Um, so I've got a very complex business with five SKUs for this example. My first set of results, uh, mean average percentage error, some glass half empty, of 19%. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. I'll sit on the beach, put the sunglasses on, have a big smile. The next set of, resu of results, I've got pretty much the same, same result, yeah, the same average percentage error. But I've got this one here, which is a minus 70%. So we'll call that an undersell. I've undersold by 70%. So I've now got a whole heap of stock because my supply chain is not yet agile enough, responsive enough, and I've got this lump of stock which has got no value because I can't sell it. Okay? And because I can't sell it, my sales team are frustrated because they're trying to push a product 
to customers that they don't want. So we're having to discount it. And the worst possible outcome, particularly with the climate change awareness, is it could end up being written off or destroyed. But I've got the same percentage average error. So on that one, I'm not actually too happy. The next one, 16%. Yeah, fairly nice mix of above the line, below the line, some over forecasts, some under forecasts. Yeah, I'm, again, I'm pretty happy. The next one, I've actually undersold every single product by 16%. My average error is 16%. Okay, but the CEO, he's not very happy with me because he's just gone out to a stock exchange and informed them that we're on plan. We're going to hit our quarterly commitments. And then he has a pretty nasty surprise that we've undershipped or undersold consistently across the, across the board. So a business that over-promises and then under-delivers. Okay? So again, I'm not particularly in his good books, and maybe rather than that, he's doing that. You know, it's time for you to move on, Mr. Dickin. Yeah? Your forecasting is causing me a problem. So those are some reasons why we don't like MAPE or WAPE. What we do use is very much um, spread of error. And we will report those in histograms. And everything on this side is an oversale. Everything on the left-hand side, we've undersold. And we will look at how many of our forecasts are hitting green. Yeah? What percentage of the number of forecasts, what value do they represent, and what volume in units do they represent? Because on this right-hand side, these are all my service issues. Okay? This is creating sales to have to apologize to the customer or we are expediting products, we have got express shipments, air freight going on, or we're making a special production, weekend running, overtime, all the good stuff that supply chain professionals would do to avoid a service failure. But all of that is costing the business money, and it's waste, and it's energy. And it's pretty, um, you know, some people thrive on it, but if, it, if it's every day you're in a supply crisis, it can be pretty, pretty de-energizing. This side is a risk. This is products I'm not going to sell. I've got a significant uh, undersell. It's going to be obsolete stock. Okay? So what we focus on is the distribution of the error. And we really want to drive a behavior on the demand planners to focus on eliminating these first. Don't worry about my average percentage error. I want to take the noise out of the business. I want to stop distracting supply chain and sales and marketing from doing completely non-value added wasteful activities. Okay. The KPI we would report is what percentage of the forecasts are hitting green. How do you define green? Well, you might choose to uh, define that in very mature processes. You, that may depend on the group of products. If you have a group of products where you have a lot of agility in your supply chain, it's not too volatile in the sales, maybe the profit margin is not that great, then for those products, you may not need to be so accurate. So you might have a broader range of green. If you have products that are high value, high cost, high margin, and the supply chain for those products, those production lines or those molding equipments are very tight on capacity, for those ones, I might want to focus on a narrower band of error. Okay, so I'm trying to create a behavior where the demand planners are focusing on being accurate for where the business needs it and accurate enough. Uh, so I mentioned that we will look at uh, both the number of forecasts. So, for example, there's 148 forecasts within plus or minus uh, 10%. There's 54 where the forecast error, the undersell is between 30 and 50%. And we also will look at the volume associated with those forecasts. And with Lego, we actually have on the same report the number of forecasts, the volume, and the value. So the demand planner can choose where he or she really wants to focus. So a huge number of reds here, quite disastrous. The volume impact is less so, but we still see that as a pretty poor result. There's a lot of reds there. What would we aim to achieve? Uh, so in our previous business, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the percentage of volume of forecast that were within plus or minus 5%. Okay, we, had, we still had more red than we would ideally want, um, but we were getting to the point where 
the level of volume that it accounted for was pretty minor, was pretty small. How do we do that? It's a bit like the, I guess I'm fortunate enough to start my career with Procter & Gamble in manufacturing, and you learn about good daily systems, weekly processes, monthly processes. So every day, what are my exceptions? So the demand planner is looking every day at the exceptions that are, are, are being thrown up. Weekly improvement meetings to look at the last couple of weeks' performance, and each month, a monthly deep dive to try and find common issues across different products, different demand planners, different customers, and really get to the root cause. The second measure we use is bias. So our definition of bias is four consecutive results of over forecast or four consecutive under forecast. We would look at that at the level of a SKU, a customer, a product family, a country, a region. Could be a particular sales person, yeah, but which accounts are they responsible for? Is that individual driving consistent over sales uh, sorry, over forecast or under forecast. We'll use different lags, and in the near-term horizon, we may look at bias in weekly buckets, and then in the longer-term horizon, we might be more in, in monthly buckets. For the dairy industry, for fresh milk, um, where we have 1,000 SKUs to, uh, to supply to 12,000 delivery points every day, but less than one day's inventory, we actually got into the level of detail of what's our bias by day of the week. Yeah. So we could see if we were consistently over forecasting as we were on the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but under forecasting Sunday and Saturday. Okay. And that enabled us to, adju to adjust the parameters within, uh, I think that was Info we were using for that, um, on how it split the demand across, because it created a weekly forecast and then would split it down through our algorithms to Monday to Sunday, and we could tweak those. Probably not necessary for most of your businesses and industries, but that's the level of detail we, we got into. In terms of bias, how do you turn that into a KPI? We would report or measure demand planners on what percentage of the uh, SKUs at any moment in time are in bias. How much volume does that account for? and how much value does that account for? So um, we've got an IBP, SNOP panel in the moment, um, and you know, volume and value is units as well as value. So we'd look at it in both of those parameters. In the three businesses now where we've put this in, at four actually, the start point has always been at least 20% of the SKUs are in bias, okay? So when we looked at this for a current client, you look at it and you go, do you know what? You've been under forecasting the same, not the same product, but the whole theme of products for nine consecutive months. Yeah? And there's a real behavioral issue in here, which is saying to, to the business, it's just not good enough. Yeah? So that focus on bias can also be applied to your um, volume forecasting, but also to financial profit forecasting. I remember being uh, with Chris at the front here in the board meeting in one of the companies we both worked for, and it, it wasn't particularly good news. We were five months into the year. The forecast for the next seven months was to generate further losses. So the CEO was not particularly happy to be told, sorry, boss, you're going to lose another £20 million before the end of the year. Okay. And then, Mike said, sorry boss, it's not 20 million you're going to lose. You're going to lose more like 40 million. Okay. At which point the room went quiet. I was about as popular as coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, and he said, you know, justify that statement. So I felt about this big. And I said, well boss, every month for the last five months, we've said we're going to make a loss of 2 million and every month we've lost 2 or 3 million more. And I don't see anything in our plans that's going to change that. Okay? I and mean, then the debate was, oh, but they've all been one-offs. Yeah, they have. But they've all been different one-offs. And I'm, I'm absolutely confident that next month there'll be a one-off that we don't yet know about. And then another one the month after. Okay? 
So that then changed the spirit in the room to the CEO who said, yeah, I think you're right. And then he turned to his direct reports and said, what the F are you going to do about it? At which point I thought, <laughs> survived that one. <laughs> but you can also apply it to your financial forecasting as well. And we would say that eliminating bias is a key behaviour to your SNOP and IBP processes. If you have bias in your culture, then it's going to be very hard to have a successful IBP process. And within Lego, we've been looking at the uh, SNOP behaviours, the IBP behaviours, and the board have signed off that eliminating bias is one of their key behaviours that they will measure, not just in that top management review, but in every single sub-process that feeds into the SNOP. Yep. When we asked a question earlier about how do we measure demand planning yeah, and demand planners, glass half full, how accurate are they? But we focus on the accuracy. So we are training the behaviour into our demand planners that that accuracy, you have to be accurate. If you can't get an accurate forecast, you're not a good, uh, necessarily a good demand planner. And what we try to do is say to demand planners, there are times when you just don't know. The product is so innovative or the... Um, promotion we're running is so new that if you don't really know what the forecast is going to be, tell us. Because if you tell us in advance, we can then create contingency plans with supply planning and manufacturing and logistics and sales to actually work on the range. And we would typically aim to have a planning scenario that could deal with an undersale of 50% or an oversale of 100%. Okay? If you can't achieve that, and you then have to start throwing money at it, be that inventory or excess capacity. We then have to have that trade-off discussion in the IBP process around what's the trade-off between service and uh, protecting sales. But at least then it's a joined-up discussion, and we've been honest about what we don't know. So step three, um, there's going to be a plug in a moment for Llamasoft, um, who were uh, presenting earlier on. Um, so step three is one set of numbers. And I see demand planning can really be at the centre of having uh, one set of numbers. When I was with Avon Cosmetics, uh, we engaged with Ollie Wrights to come in and help us with SNOP, IBP implementation. And one of the first things they reported back is that we had over 20 versions of demand plan. So every function, every part of the business were creating their own view of what the sales were going to be. Partly out of lack of trust, they thought that, you know, well, we don't really trust supply chains, so we'll put a bit more in. Yeah. But also partly out of each part of the business wants their demand expressed in a different way. So if you are in sales, you're interested in the, uh, the value. If you are in logistics, it's the cube. If you're in production, it's how many units down that, down that production line. If it's in mixing, it's in, in your ingredients requirements and procurement. So every part of the business is taking a demand plan, which is delivered in, I want X many boxes of this, and they turn it into what they need. And what you find is, or what we found was, everybody was using imperfect processes. Not everybody was using the latest data. So there were, well, as we said, 20 versions of the truth. The other challenge we had was the demand planning system generated a view of the world with the current customer base. And we were able to link that to which store would it be delivered to and therefore which depot would it go from. And we could link the depot to a manufacturing location. The challenge we had is we knew that we were going to lose customers and win customers. We were going to close depots and open depots and move production lines around the country across a network of seven dairies. So, but the demand plan we were given was just one static view, but we wanted a three-year view. Yeah? And we wanted it to reflect all of the known changes that were going to happen. You may be surprised to know, as my ladies on the right-hand side are showing, that not every cow is the same. Okay? So we would have organic cows, non-organic cows, but a Sainsbury cow is different to an M&S cow, which is different to a Waitrose cow, yeah, which is different to a Morrison's cow. 
A Welsh cow is also different to an English cow, believe it or not, and they're different to a West Country cow and they're different to a Scottish cow. So we had over 20 different types of milk that we could not mix. So we also needed to know what's our supply and demand balance, not just on the finished skew that's on the shelf, but by the type of milk, as well as the bottle size, as well as the uh, amount of cream content. Is it going to be skim, semi, 1% or full fat? If you get that wrong, that balance wrong, and the lead time on increasing your cow stock or decreasing it is not instantaneous, if you get it wrong, you are financially going to be slaughtered. Yep. Because if you have to buy milk on the open market, you pay a premium. If you need to sell milk you don't need, you get nothing for it. Okay? So it's a really important question to be able to answer. But it's a loss-making business. Okay? Fresh milk does not make money. Okay? So it's a loss-making business, so we weren't given the luxury of an ERP solution to try and solve that. So what we did is we took that demand plan, uh, we chucked it into Excel but we chucked it into an Excel tool that was way beyond our own capabilities. And if you went to use it, you would not think you were using Excel. Okay? We then used that to hold all those changes in sales and all the changes in which uh, depots we're going to use, which factories over a three-year horizon. So we had to recreate the demand plan from a static start, extend it to three years, and then reflect all of our known business changes. We need to create some space. For each of those products, we use master data or the data lake, which we created, with the, uh, what are the key properties of that product. Okay? So it's a four-pint bottle, it's semi-skim, it's organic milk. It's going to go to that part of the country, to that customer. That then enabled us to have this dynamic three-year demand plan, yes, at the finished bottle level, but also at the bottle size, so the bottle blowing plants, how much cream content it would have, which is absolutely fundamental for a dairy business. Uh, the milk is worth 10, 20 pence a litre. The cream can be up to uh, 200 pounds. Per, uh, sorry, 200 pence per litre. Yep. Tell us which type of cow we need over the three years. And we would use Tableau to visualize all of that data. And what it meant was, instead of there being 30, 40, 50 different spreadsheets in the business, so milk, milk procurement with their spreadsheet, yeah, the bottle blowers with their spreadsheet, and the, the factories with their spreadsheet, they all went. And the only source of any rough cut capacity plan is if you wanted to know the three-year rough cut capacity for sales value or volume, you went to Tableau, one place. So we went from having 20 versions of the demand plan to one, and one only. We also used LlamaSoft uh, for their network optimization tool to really help us to streamline the best combination of 3,000 farms, 12,000 delivery points, 30 production lines, 30 depots, what's the best end-to-end -end source and solution. Yeah, and again, we chucked that into Tableau. Ignoring the Llama Soft piece, that cost us less than 60,000 pounds and took four months. Okay, and we used existing, we just used what we already had and just took the data out, played around with it and put it back in. If you compare that to you trying to do a SAP implementation or anything else, then it's, I think it's, it's, it's significantly different. We can't ignore it, machine learning and artificial intelligence. How many of you are engaging currently with a machine learning or AI demand forecasting initiative? One there, yeah. Is that it? <laughs> so Lego are on that path. Um, so machine learning, according to the IBF, is the technology which will have the biggest impact over the next uh, seven years. It does combine in the Internet of Things and this huge amount of data that's now available with artificial intelligence learning algorithms. And I guess the simplest way I think of it is it looks at historical sales. And it goes back in time 
It says, well, if I'm forecasting for those sales from here, I'm going to use all these different models and algorithms. Which of those algorithms gave me the closest fit to the actual results? So I'm going to use that one for that product or that set of products. More advanced machine learning tools will actually blend the results of lots of different models in some kind of weighting system or democratic system. Um, but the challenge we have is that you've got to feed it an awful lot of data. Okay? So within the Lego group, um, it is achieving a result. And the result it's achieving is comparable to the current methods. Okay? It's not beating the current methods, but it's getting there, if you like, at the press of a button. Okay? So what it then does, it does free up the time for the demand planner to take that stat forecast as a starting point and then apply anything that they know of assumptions to adjust that. And the aim is, and by if you go back to that very beginning of the presentation on that spread of error, if we know how good the stat engine is and which products it always gets green for, why would you touch it? Yeah. So it's also helping us to, to link that way of measuring the performance so when my data analytics, uh, data scientists were telling me the machine learning has got to a MAPE of 60%, woohoo, I said, what's MAPE? And they looked at me, because they know damn well I know what it is. I said, what's MAPE? Got no interest in MAPE, show me the histograms. And we got a bit of resistance, but now they're fully on board. So now everything is being shown through the, through the histograms. If we want to reach a point where 70% of the forecasts, we don't have to touch them. It's hands off the wheel. The 30%, going back to step two, we don't know what we don't know. Let's now apply our energy and focus to those and generate those contingency plans for how we're going to micromanage them. So we're freeing up people's time and energy to manage the outliers. <clears throat> so in the room, we had one person say, yep, yeah, we're on that journey. So there are limited case studies. So preparing for this, when Leon asked me to to cover a session about four or five months ago, Googled, had a good search, what can I find for practical examples? There's not a lot out there that you can just pull out. Lots of papers on the science, but not a lot of examples of how company X has done this and they've achieved, they've achieved Y. So why is that? You've got to get your data set in good shape first. Okay, and that can require, because you are moving or using a lot of data in the machine learning. And there's two sides to that. It's the amount of data you need to make sure is in reasonably good state. Yeah? And I would advocate things like um, some of the machine learning tools out there to speed that up. Um, but it also means you've got to have pretty good computing power internally. And that's one of the things we've had to, that Lego have had to take a step back on is recognize the size of their IT pipes weren't big enough to handle this technology. So they've had to lay that infrastructure in. In step one of our journey in machine learning, we're only really feeding it so much information. We're not yet able to tell it historically what the promotional spend was, what the marketing activities were, what was the weather like during that period of time? How well did that film do in the box office? Because a lot of the products are linked to Frozen, or Disney, not all of them. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things we know will definitely enrich the performance, but we're probably a couple of years from being able to feed that in. There's also something called the black box syndrome. Yeah. So you may have a sales director or an MD or general manager of a country, and they're absolutely convinced that this product is going to be the best product ever. Okay. They've got some reasons behind that. And you say, ah, yeah, but the black box says it's going to be down here. And they say, well, what assumptions is it taken in? Well, I don't really know because it's a bit of a black box, but you just need to trust it. You know? just need to believe me. So that can be quite a hard discussion to have. So I'm going to make the assumption for now that we still need people you know, to help us with demand planning. Anybody in the room a demand planner or has been a demand planner? Yeah. In my view, it's one of the toughest jobs around. 
especially now, because you have to be, demand planning isn't just forecasting. It's also a business planning process. And the demand planner needs to be bilingual. They need to be multilingual. You have to talk to supply chain. You have to talk to logistics in units or cubic meters. And you also need to talk to finance in margin. And you need to talk to sales in revenue. Okay? So you have to be multilingual. You have to understand the supply chain part of the business and also the commercial part of the business. But as somebody said in an earlier talk, you know, data science, you're a bit nerdy. Okay, so demand planners also have to have a degree of technical numeracy. So you're trying to find people who are good with numbers, their technical mastery is good, but they're also able to communicate and collaborate effectively across the whole business, you know, which makes good demand planners hard to find. And I think in the past, we've actually gave up trying to find good demand planners at a price that we could afford. So we ended up recruiting people who we knew had those skills, and we taught them those. And we found that was a more effective way. So five steps, just to recap. Uh, the right measures. Yeah, so we use a spread of error and bias. Admitting you cannot be right all of the time. Really getting the demand plan to be truly the single set of numbers. So nobody's creating their own version. I think you should explore what benefits machine learning and AI can bring. But there's a lot of preparation to be ready for that. And people and behaviours. We've touched on some of the behaviours during the talk. Our mantra has always been, it is absolutely achievable to have zero uh, service failures. And we mean zero, not 98% with absolutely no short code wastage and only one set of numbers in the business. But it is always underpinned by people. And actually, in my experience, when people say agility costs too much money, we've never found that. We've always found getting the agility in the right places has actually reduced cost. So we actually deliver to the business at the best possible margin. Okay? And if you were to go onto our Website, yeah, you'll see that circle. It's a shameless plug. Uh, you'll see that is our, very much our mantra. Okay. So I don't know how we're doing for time. 10 minutes, there we go. So any questions or thoughts? <laughs> Good question. Um, so I've seen it report into finance. That was a bit of a car crash. Um, but reporting into finance, it was very much the uh, demand plan was forced to fit the result that the finance organisation wanted to see. Okay, so we want a profit of 10 million. Make sure the demand plan reflects a profit of, of 10 million. Um, I'm not a big fan, actually, of planning reporting into supply chain either. I think planning is a profession in its own right and should be respected <coughs> as a profession in its own right. So I'm a big advocate of um, the planning director reporting straight into either the MD in the same way as the sales director would and the manufacturing director would and the logistics director would. So I think if you want planning to be the one version of the truth, yeah, then that's the best place for it to be. And it is a profession, it is a skill set, and it should be recognised in the same way. Um, well, I've always enjoyed, in my roles, I have had demand planning, materials planning, supply planning, and SNOP responsibility under me as the planning director. Uh, I've always found that to be pretty useful because you can actually encourage people to talk to each other, um, which is a bit of a novel, <laughs> novel concept. Uh, so I've always found that to be a, a good way of, of structuring it. Do people need to be co-located? Not necessarily, but it, I think it can. It helps, but it's not a, it's not a necessity. 
in my view. I've seen uh, scheduling work with schedulers at the site, at each of the seven sites, and then the same industry schedulers are centralized and remote. Yeah? But the same result was there. You still, though, had to create those positive relationships with the, with the factories. I find it really interesting that, that there was a previous um, presentation done by Anaplac and they were quite scornful of using Excel and, uh, and the fact that they, they used that as a, as a, of course you've got problems, you use Excel. Yeah. Where, whereas, whereas you've been quite open in the fact that, you, that you've managed to get quite a lot out of Excel, albeit with a different front, front end. Yes. And so I find that we didn't interesting. Yes. So, so it's, like, it's like it's very easy to bad mouth the overuse of Excel. Yes. What you seem to have done is limit the use of it so that there are lots of different Excels everywhere. Yes. So a single one. Correct. Very well built. Yes. With, with the functionality that you want. Yes. So, so it isn't that Excel is terrible. I'll give you another example of using Excel. Um, so in, um, in Muller, uh, their scheduling system uh, AS400, it just made no sense at all. Yeah, I just couldn't understand it. So, but it was so embedded in the business, they used AS400 for all of the depots use it for putting their stocks in. So AS400 was completely and utterly embedded in the whole business. So we had to st take a step back and go, we haven't got the money to implement anything else. So what we did is we said, you know what? We take the data as it goes into AS400, we bypass it into Excel, yeah? we do our finite scheduling, working out what's you know, to our safety stock models in Excel, and then we push it back into AS400. And we use AS400 as a communication tool across the business. That costs us 8,000 pounds. And that took us from, um, from being able to, because with milk, Christmas is a nightmare because the cows keep producing, but everybody goes shopping on the same day. Yep. So you have this artificial peak of demand that you have to prepare for 25 days in advance, because I've only got two or 3% spare capacity. And I've got to be, so that micromanaging of 1,000 SKUs across 30 production lines, across the dep 30 depots, yeah, and having the safety stock really precise, uh, we found the best way to do that was in Excel. Yep. So uh, we took it out of the system put it back into Excel, and we were able to use Tableau to give us hour by hour line loading during that 35 day critical period. Okay. So, but I think when you listen, I don't know if you're in the E2E, the, and the E2 Open uh, presentation, and they talk about having that data layer. That's what we see is really powerful. So if you can get your systems, existing systems you have, to free data in and out of that layer, you can start connecting it with your massive data and drive really powerful things. Yeah? But this is an Excel product. Okay? This wasn't some guys who are really good at doing pivot tables. It was more than that. Yeah? But by using the right skills of the right people, we deliver something in five months for less than 60,000 pounds that I think other businesses spend tens of millions or millions on. Yeah? And it's that pragmatic approach. Right? So I said at the beginning, in this presentation, we've achieved this, including that 95% of volume forecast within plus or minus 5%. We've achieved it using a multitude of existing demand planning tools. We've got Future Master, CDP, Infor, we had Demantra, um, a SAP, APO, DP, yeah, to name but a few. But we've just used the same approach. Yeah, so I don't think Excel is evil. I think it can be a very powerful. I think Microsoft have done some good work. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, so I'm going to be around. I've got now got to get ready for a panel. <laughs> so no, no rest for the record. Thank you.